Um, so we'd like to invite then the next speaker, um, Sabelo Dada, and uh, looking at resisting mining in uh, Somalia. <coughs> And yeah, so the specifically the experiences in KZN. Welcome. <coughs> Program director, ladies and gentlemen, son Lord. Yeah. Yes, indeed, I'm Sabelo's Lada. I come from KZN in an area called Somke. So basically where I come from, there is a mining company that is already mining under side coal. It's an open cast coal mine called Tendel, uh, normally known as Sunkele Mine. So this mine was awarded the first mining right in 2007. And again, they got another mining right in 2011. And they just got a new amended mining right in 2016 <coughs> that we just learned about in 2017 when we were busy uh, preparing for court action against the mining rights that were already existing. So I will tell you how it relates to the, the dialogue that we're having today about these big uh, that are causing serious threat on our rights as the people from rural areas <coughs> to own land. So, these mining rights that I'm talking about, they were not just merely granted. There were processes that were supposed to be followed and people to be consulted. And uh, unfortunately, what we've discovered is that most of the people, like ordinary community people, were never uh, consulted uh, from the processes. So, in 2016, the application for 32 square kilometer uh, initial application that was brought by the mining company was granted. But the problem, the actual mining right that was granted, it was for 222 square kilometer, which is something that was never applied for, which uh, gives us a, a problem. As the result, we had to try and exhaust all the internal remedies available within the Department of Mineral Resources to try and appeal this mining right. And then it escalated from the regional manager to the director general until it reached the current Minister of Mineral Resources, Ubabu Kwede Mandashe who actually finally confirmed in <coughs> June last year that these mining rights were rightfully granted. So, who gave consent to these mining rights and who was actually consulted? <coughs> Those are the questions that kept begging us. But as the process <coughs> unfolded, we discovered who are those people that actually gave the go-ahead of this project. And it could be nothing other than the traditional leaders. So it was the Ngozi, the late Ngozi, uh, the traditional council, Union traditional council, and Tuba Tuba municipality. They signed that people were consulted and they had no objection to the application that was brought of the future mining right that was granted in 2016. So I'm trying to demonstrate that already, although these bills are not yet signed into law by the president, but already where I come from, it seems like they've been into effect for a very long time. And it's a serious problem because we had to act at the end of the day to fight and defend our right as the ordinary people. And when we do that, it's unfortunate that it always seems as if we are defying our very own chiefs or traditional leaders. They find it very offensive that 
to such an extent that we are no longer even allowed to hold our meetings. So I'll make an example of two cases. So last year, my own mother was called by a community of another village to come and explain how our organization follows the community environmental justice organization works. She went there on an invitation and explained everything. And then on that meeting, uh, the council for the donor phoned the donor to say, there is a meeting that is underway here. Are you aware of such meeting? And then the donor said, no, I did not give God for that meeting. Yes, the people, they did inform him of the meeting. But he thinks that he was supposed to give the go-ahead for that meeting, which is totally wrong. Uh, that Luna even went to someone here to appear before the traditional council. And she did appear before the traditional council last year in June. And the matter was then discussed. But the traditional council luckily ruled otherwise. They said no. But they did inform me. In fact, they do have a right to meet whenever they want to meet and discuss things that concern them as a the community. You don't have the right as the donor to say no meetings at all, as long as it relates to mining, no meeting. Because the problem is not just ordinary meetings. The problem is that you are meeting to discuss a mining issue. Why is it a problem? Some of the traditional the, uh, leaders are actually mine employees. Some they've got their sons that are doing serious business with the mine. That are doing tenders, some they're transporting mine workers, they're in taxi industry. So those are all the people that from time to time will tend to give us uh, problems when we try to raise our voice because already they feel like we are challenging them somehow. They don't see the big picture of, of, of what we're actually fighting for. In fact, they should be rallying behind us as well. But because they are already benefiting from the project that came with them on a back door, it's not easy for them. They've got contracts as well that they sign with this company. So one of the problems that makes our case in some Somkele to be quite distinguishable from other cases is that we also have Ingonyama Transport established in terms of the Wazunga Dal Provincial Legislature. Mm. Ingonyama Transport is the one who will lease, who will grant the lease to the mine mm. without Call the people that already occupy the land having to consent or having been consulted for that matter. They just grant this, this, is, this. Is. So I had a case of one of our members that was trying to access a, a lease from the Ngonyama Transport. He could not get that lease. Why? Because the, the lease from that area has been granted under this future mining right of 222 square kilometer. It has been granted to the mine, so the Ngonyama Transport cannot grant two leases on the same land. It's a problem because the, people, the person I'm referring to is got a household. He's been there for like ages. It's just that he did not have a piece of paper to say, this is the land that I own or the land that I'm using. And the other problem that this uh, bill will make it even worse is to decide or to, to see, to identify our needs as the community. Because this is what it says in the section 20, that they will identify our needs as the community. It's the other way around. We should be identifying our needs and giving them a mandate of what needs to be done. Because once we give, once this bill gives them those powers, already 
It's a disaster. And again, other speakers have mentioned the Section 24, which allows them to enter into agreement. Like I've already said, they are doing it where I come from. They have already entered into agreement with the mining companies. And it's difficult. We're trying to fight this. There's something else happening. We're trying to stop them. On the other hand, they've got a new mining right to go to move into fisher mining areas because we've instituted two court actions against them. One, in 2017, we tried to approach the Pretama Respect High Court for an interdict order because their operations were, we believe, they are illegal because of what I've just mentioned. That prior consent was not uh, uh, given by the rightful owners and people were never consulted. It was just those one or three, two institutions that were consulted, I think. Yeah, I'm struck by this idea of your mother being invited to come account for you. Right? Yeah. So I think as we have these conversations, it's easy to just look at the structural um, issues that we're dealing with, but it's human beings that are being impacted on a day-to-day -day basis. And what's the cost of that at a personal level? So thank you very much for sharing. Um, so we'd like to sp uh, invite the next speaker. Um, so Shirami Shirinda, and apologies if I'm not getting that correctly, um, to share experiences from Limpopo. And, uh, and that's our last speaker before we open up for the conversation. Thank you very much. No, thanks. Uh, you, you pronounce it very well. <laughs> and it's Shirami Shirinda, it's a rhyming like surname and name. It's one of the beautiful names in, in the whole Africa. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay, um, uh, uh, good morning everyone. Uh, my name is Shirami Shirinda. I'm, I'm a lawyer and a researcher. So I'm a legal researcher. I'm working with the Legal Resources Center, uh, operating mostly in Northwest, Nipompo, and Pumalanga. I'm also a chairperson of a, of a royal castle, it's a family royal castle. So my great-grandfather it's, it's, it's got, um, was, was a traditional leader, and the village where I stay is named after him. So he got this traditional leadership customarily. <coughs> So there are many things which he was recognized for. One of the things is that he was knowing some medicine to do some magician when they were fighting wars. So they ended up giving him that uh, traditional leadership. That's how he got it. He didn't get it from apartheid. He got it from the people. Maybe they were afraid of his magician <laughs> practice. So um, I would be speaking here based on the experience I have as a person from that royal family, especially as to how courts operate, what the so-called court, uh, I don't recognize uh, those things as court. Mm -hmm. uh, to me, I, I say it's a, it's a forum for dispute resolution and for discussing uh, things like developments and other things, it's not a court. Court in terms of the law is something else. It needs to have a presiding officer. There should be lawyers representing clients. Uh, there's a way of doing it. It's very different from how uh, people in villages practice customary system of mediation and, and dispute resolution. So, um, my role in the royal family uh, is like I'm a chairperson. This chairmanship, I got it from the aunt and the uncles. The reason they chose me to be in that position is when we're gathering as a family of a traditional leader. So they realized that uh, I've studied law and I've grown up in that family, seeing everything happening, how things are done. So the new traditional leader who's there is the, the, my son, is the son of my brother. It's young and he's not educated. Uh, the part of not educated, I'll come to it. You know, in our customs, our tradition, I don't know where it comes from, uh, there's a tendency of people who are born in the royal family 
not to go to school. Once they hear that they will be chiefs or whatever, they stop going to school. I don't know where it's coming from. So in my family, it's like that. About four people who were ruling there, they all did not pass even standard five. So even the current one now, he passed standard seven. So the aunt and uncle said, no, Sharami, because you are a lawyer and you, you have learned how things are done, uh, we want you to advise him. So they always chose me as a, a chairperson. And uh, I'm happy they listen to my advices because I don't advise them uh, wrong things. I usually look at the law. I also check how the customer system works. And then I combine the two. We're able to do what that family has to do in terms of our custom. But unfortunately, it's like people outside, they tend to come in and try to influence him otherwise. Uh, he's not listening to us every time. So that's the other uh, uh, situation which we are facing. So uh, about the family, I'll stop there. Uh, I'll come to the way uh, I'm working with the Legal Resource Center as a legal researcher. Um, uh, I've got documents from the archives which are indicating how many traditional leaders have been uh, given the positions. Uh, in the Zodpats back, back area in Lipompo, not far from Zimbabwe, uh, about 100 kilometers, um, there was a, a researcher who was a white person who was going around farms and villages. He would be documenting uh, people who were paying tax then, when, after 1948. He would be checking who, who was paying tax and who was that person's uh, leader. So they will record, and if they found that a certain particular leader, many people were paying tax uh, under him or under that jurisdiction, they will recognize that person as a chief. So uh, you will not be surprised if today we say many people who are traditional leaders today have been put there by apartheid. That was the system which was used. I've got the documents from the archives which are like that. And there's another group of traditional leaders who have been put in traditional leadership positions in a way of some commissioners who were moving around uh, villages, holding meetings with uh, leaders of the communities. And each leader would stand up saying, I'm independent, I'm on my own. Uh, they were looking for, they were trying to combine groups and put one traditional leader as seniors. So most senior traditional leaders have got the senior traditional leadership status in that way. They will hold two to three meetings with that commissioner. The third commissioner or the fourth, he was coming with a certificate to give one out of all those people. That happened in, in, in the village where I'm coming from. Our senior traditional leader got that status in that way. I've got the document from the archive which is showing that. In those commissions, usually you find that the person who was interpreting was a police officer, and the commissioner was also magistrate. You know how it was working in the previous time. Um, I was lucky. I was also a, a police officer in the uh, before nineteen before nineteen eighty, with the one arresting people for not having passbooks and other things. So the people were arrested were taking them to the commissioner of Bantu affairs. So that the same commissioner was working as a magistrate. So you will see like if you hear the word commissioner, then that the same person is also magistrate. So uh, he, he, he had this police officer as, a, as an interpreter. So you find in most cases the interpretation has robbed many people of their status because what he was telling the commissioner uh, I, I, I doubt whether it was the correct message. In most cases, if it was about Tonga traditional leaders, they will get a vendor speaking police to interpret, or they get a PD speaking police to interpret for the other language. So usually it was not the person who's speaking the same language who will be an interpreter. There are lots of archival documents in Pretoria which can show you that, that way of things. So if somebody stand up and say, no, I'm a senior traditional leader, I got it in this way, this way, 
most of them have got it in that way. So this, this uh, constitution of ours has got two sections, section 211 and section 212. Those two sections, they are recognizing the traditional leadership and institution and also the role of traditional leaders. I think traditional leaders should be lucky to have those two sections because it's the same sections which are allowing them to earn a salary. A salary is for employees. If you are not an employee, you don't get salary. I think you will be getting something else. So these people are earning that salary, which means they are employees of the state. They are not leaders of the people. So that's why the state is paying them money. So constitution is just like that, so they are lucky to have those two clauses. The problem now is that these two clauses are translated now to the bills you hear about now. I uh, will speak about the TCB, Traditional Court Bill, uh, which I already indicated that we, in terms of custom, we did not have courts. We have forums of resolving disputes and forums of discussing development. So uh, the government now is trying to give these people powers which they never had in terms of custom, uh, which powers in the democratic situation, the powers are not necessary. So, so personally, I think the traditional leadership, uh, the traditional leaders, uh, they don't have a role in a democratic situation. Because we vote for what councillors, we vote for the provincial people to be there and everybody. So we never vote for chiefs, so yeah. which means they were not supposed to be there. Yeah. We have local government to do everything for us, and if they are not doing the right thing, we toy toy against them. In some situations, they even burn houses of the councillors when they are not doing right. So you can see they are able to regulate them. So the traditional leaders, uh, it's good that they are getting salary. They should behave about that only. I've got three cases which I want to give as an example of uh, what will happen if the traditional court bill is passed. Um, there's the case of Mr. Petro Mashiko is here in front of me. You can stand up that I talk about someone who is here. He's a white councillor elected um, by the people. He's a councillor for ANC. But because he's testifying against the imposition of tribal levies. In Lipopo, we have the law which is saying that if traditional leaders are to be imposed on people, it has to be gazetted. We don't have a single gazette of tribal levies and people are paying that. So Mr. Mashiku wrote a statement and testified against that. So the chief does not like him. He's not allowed to go to villages to talk to people, even when development is happening, he's supposed to say the chief does not want him in any of the villages under his control. So you can see if the, the bill is passed, a person like him can even be like expelled from the village. Yeah. Another example is for a woman called Christina Mutumukulu, uh, who, whose son's body was in the Moshara for five years, after the community people have exhumed the body believing that the mother is a witch, of which the chief, who was a magistrate, also supported the community to say that person uh, is not good, not wanted in the area, and the, the son, the deceased son, should not be reburied. He came with a, a, a custom which he just fabricated, which is never, it's not known, it never happened. When we talk of custom, it's a situation where we have done something repeatedly, in the village, I mean, saying this is how we do things. It has never happened in their area. They have never exhumed the, exhumed the body, but they were calling it a custom. So it, the lady was fined 6,000 for failing to bury a son. It, and she was not failing. They were refusing her to, 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 to bury, but they still fined her 6,000 rand. So if this bill passed, uh, this woman who is a widow, her husband passed away. So most women, will be in trouble if they are staying with the chiefs. And also, the traditional court bill is about courts which will be operating in bantus, in form of bantu stands, of which South Africa is one. So uh, such a law, I think, is unconstitutional by just look, looking at 
that South Africa is one and we have called for rural people and called for urban people. That's very wrong the way I see it. The interpretation there is wrong. So they want these chiefs to be presiding officers when they've not studied an interpretation of statute. So if you are a presiding officer, you have to have studied interpretation of statute. You'll be able to understand words, connect them and everything. They should be first taken to to school for four years to study LNB. Uh, it's then that they will be able to, to be presiding officers. Otherwise, this bill should not pass. Thank you. You know, sometimes I always say that um, every tribe is different. Uh, as we are talking about the women, uh, in terms of the custom, in Pondoland, we are so different. And we are very proud of that. Women are so much been recognized. And I can make an example. As we are talking about that, women, they don't have <coughs> access to land. Yeah. But in Pondoland, they, they, they are the priorities. If you are married, you are, I mean, you are unmarried, you have access to have a land. But if you are a man, you are unmarried, you can't get a land. Yeah. That is Pondoland. That is why right now, the government is pushing the fee, I mean the male in Pondoland because in Pondoland we even nominate a female as our written. But they said no, she can't uh, 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 rule uh, the, the nation of Pondoland because she's a male. Because they understand the issues of a females. And if we continue to allow this TKLB, I still repeat that. It's promote a, 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 that a oppressing of women. That is why I said that we need to be stand up and fight for that and to make sure that this TKLB is not going to be passed. So, initial reactions to the report released by the President's Advisory Panel. Um, on the face of it, the report looks quite good. We're obviously still studying it quite carefully. What we really do welcome is that the report underscores what was said by the high-level panel, um, which was led by uh, former President Khalema Matlante, with regards to the Ingonyama Trust Board. Um, it, too, recommends that the Ingonyama Trust Board be reviewed um, and potentially uh, that it uh, be repealed, which, in the light of what you've heard today uh, from colleagues from Kwasi Natal, but also in the light of the current ongoing litigation against the Onyama Trust um, is quite a welcomed recommendation. Um, in terms of you know what the report says about restitution, um, I think it comes as cold comfort in the sense that, again, many of the communities who are in the room um, uh, are part of communities that have had long-standing land claims. Uh, and really, I think what is important for us is that the panel has dealt with you know, the question of land reform and the pace of land reform, but we've been sitting with two constitutional court judgments, the Lamosa 1 case um, and more recently the, the second Lamosa judgment, um, which also dealt with the question of restitution specifically, and this was around the Restitution Amendment uh, Act. Um, and the court was very clear there in saying that the existing claims that are in the system are the claims that must be prioritized and they need to be dealt with. Uh, the Lamosa judgment has been in existence for at least a good two to three years. Um, and so really, you know, the, the question I suppose is what comes out of uh, the panel report in terms of implementation. It's one thing to have, uh, you know, encouraging statements on paper. It's another to have actual implementation. Um, that means that communities that have been sitting with existing claims in the system for over 20 years are actually afforded proper and effective relief. So I think uh, certainly what we as LARC are looking for, and I think my colleagues in the room are looking looking for um, is quite a strong indication as to what kind of implementation we can expect off the back of the uh, Presidential Advisory Panel's report. And of course, we have also been sitting with the high-level panel report as well um, for at least more than a year now. And likewise, the question there is... 14. And she was uh, forcibly evicted by her nephew. In, in partnership with LARC, we assisted Mamangadi to have a word with with her nephew, and they put the past away, and she was in a process of being part of the of the of the family. the The main challenge now is that the traditional leader in one of the traditional councils in in her area has sold thirteen hectares 
of their mother's land. They, they sold each uh, hectare for 40,000 rand, meaning that one traditional leader who is a member of a traditional council made more than 500,000, more than a half a million rand on the land which is owned by Mama Mgadi's family. My question is to our comrade Shiramu about how, as LAC and the Rural Women's Movement, we could assist or Mama Mgadi to reclaim their land. And the, the, the scary part is that those 13 people who bought 13 hectares of their land have already built very big houses on their land. So I, I, I don't know how we are going to deal with it. Maybe the panel would be able to assist us. Yes. Uh, around the TCB, what is what do you think would be the impact from your personal experience the impact on children in particular um, if this tcb was to be passed and finalized and put into the as rural communities we have been making noise about this for so many years but our government was not ready to listen to us we need to take this advantage with all the people that are here that have been invited to come and hear the experiences that we are facing almost every day in our rural communities so that we can take it up. Maybe because some of them that are sitting here, they also sit in parliament. Maybe the president and his team will be able to listen to what rural people are saying almost every day. Uh, I don't need to go back to all the acts from your 1913, 1927, 1951. But currently, the bills that are in Parliament, if they are passed by the President, uh, this our government is really taking us for a ride for the things that they want to achieve. In 1994, we were told that there will be three spheres of government, which is your national, provincial and local government. But it seems as now the very same government is pushing for another sphere where they are promoting the traditional leaders to be another sphere to even have a say to what people must decide. I think our government also, when we go back to the preamble of the constitution, they forgot something and then I, I think they need to be taken back. Before they can come up with the amendment of section 25, they must read the preamble of the constitution with understanding. It seems as something is missing there and if we don't do something now, we'll have a problem. Let me give you an example with our case at the village in closing. In closing. Uh, this TCB doesn't give us any advantage at all, but it's taking us back. We are being forced to be taken to the old uh, uh, boundaries of apartheid, which we didn't like from the very first time it was introduced. And with this bill, it means they are going back. It's only the change of the names. The very same boundaries which we have been resisting to be part of that, now we are being forced and then to be part of that uh, jurisdiction of which we don't want. So we expect people that are here to make sure that even if maybe the president doesn't listen to us as poor rural communities, and then this time we must act on whatever things that we have been giving him. Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, government wants to suppress the voices of the people that owns the land. I'll give an example. There is a research book that was written by Dr. Kevin Capps and uh, Professor Solomon Milemwa that says there's no chief that owns the land. Because the land, for it to be bought, was bought, bought by, the, by the families. So now, <laughs> we are sitting with the problem whereby they want to take those particular powers of the people that have bought the voice to say yes or no to any development in their land and give it to the chief, which is totally wrong. So I'm saying this to corroborate the, the research that has been done by the two guys that have just actually named. Two, the, another problem is that uh, we are sitting with the minister who is also a trustee of the land that was bought by certain people. Him or her being, being a trustee means that actually he or she has been given the powers to be actually endorse any other development that comes to a land because that particular person is a trustee. My understanding of the chief is that the chief is actually a custodian of a land. 
It will need research. As I said, I'm a legal researcher. We, we, we have to check some things. Like in law, there are some cases which pres prescribe. And also we have restitution of land rights, which Lamoso succeeded to, to stop it. So uh, it's possible maybe we can prepare a claim that when the claim reopens, we can lodge a claim. Or maybe if we check how this uh, uh, land was sold, we might challenge something there. But the problem now is talking about houses which have been built. Our government now is saying uh, it, it, it's, it's got the policy of not removing black people for the for black people. So it needs a lot to be researched. So, so in, in that one, without the proper research, the advice is, is not easy. And the one about children, uh, in terms of traditional court bill, uh, in, in, in our custom, it's not everything which was good. Uh, the custom I said I learned when I was young. The, when, when maybe a woman has done something wrong and he was found guilty in those uh, uh, gatherings, they will uh, expel the, the mother, sometimes take the children, or they expel the mother with the children. Uh, they didn't take care much of children. So uh, it, it's a problem if we are going back, because now we have the court, which is the guardian for children. So in traditional forums, they don't work like in the normal courts. So it won't be good, I think. Yeah, my name is Baby. Mm -hmm. I'm from Northwest. Mm -hmm. And our land is also okay. one of the targets of mining because yes. they're mining diamonds from our land and we don't have a say and we need to give consent. And that's actually a private land that was bought by our forefathers. So the chiefs is also a part of the, the government friends that are doing all these activities. And last week when I went to the public hearing <coughs> at the legislature, the chiefs were guaranteed by the speaker of speakers of Northwest that they shouldn't worry because they're, gonna, they're going to sign deals because the president is going to sign the, the TKLB mm -hmm. and they, they're going to get allowance to sign the deals with, mm -hmm. with mining companies or whoever wanted to do business with them and they're going to be paid and they shouldn't worry and their traditional council will also get going to get paid. Yeah. So it's it's really worrying because most people around the northwest in Mafiking mm. they do not know about these bills and these laws. Mm. And they do not they don't even actually know their rights as mm. residents or as landowners around around Northwest. They no. thinking that whatever the, the chief says is right because sh he's the chief and he's he's part of government. Mm. So, that's so you're saying this is from the provincial legislature, yes. the speaker yes. of the Northwest yes. Provincial Legislature. Yeah, his name is uh, Mr. Joyli. And who was participating? Just the traditional the, leaders. It was no, the, there were traditional leaders and there were municipality mm, so the people from the municipalities, different yes. municipalities around Northwest. Yes. yes. Actually, tried to query and he said that it's a done deal. No one can say anything. Well, were there any it. dissenting voice? Yeah. Were there any people questioning that? I was the only one Anyone? questioning. Really? Gosh, how did that feel? I, I felt very disappointed and I, I was I was very angry. I couldn't even sleep. Did they listen to you? I mean, did they give you? No, they you didn't. And they, they, they said to me, if I've got complaints, they'll they'll give me the 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 forms to fill. And they said I must give give them my email address. I gave it to them, but up till today I never got it because they know I always, when there's public hearings, I always make submissions, and all my submissions are always against what they they want to do. Do you have a? A local community organization on that that you're involved with or the church? Yeah, we've 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 got lo it's only our our village people mm. that that are and not all of them because some are, some are even afraid to go to our meetings because mm. the the uh, the chief is always scaring them by saying they're gonna die. Mm. Yeah. You, I spoke to Constance and and them. 
the, from ARD mm. that if I think it will be much better mm. if if we can have a dialogue at Unibo yeah. University combined with the Pika University from Poshevstrom yeah. because it's, they're all in the Northwest and invite the people around Northwest yes. to, to have dialogues yeah. like this and, and the university educate is people. A good one, yeah. Yes, that's what and I was thinking. also social workers. You know, mm. I'm a social worker and my social work code of practice of says you're there to ensure people participate in decisions that affect them. That's what the job of a social worker is. So I'm, I'm pleading with Kony them to try and, okay. and speak to Dr. Klassen and, and his a team to organize the dialogue.